Dr. Henry Rodriguez has provided a very broad and comprehensive overview of need for proteogenomics research. In today's lecture, he will discuss about two more latest initiatives, International Cancer Proteogenome Consortium or ICPC and Apollo Network. The Cancer Moonshot program is a very ambitious initiative from US government and now it is also expanding with various other international countries to build the networks where all the countries could start sharing the data which could accelerate cancer research. These initiatives by Dr. Henry Rodriguez are not only accelerating the cancer research but also helping in worldwide data sharing. Dr. Rodriguez will talk about Apollo Network which is Applied Proteogenomics Organization Learning and Outcome. The emerging field of proteogenomics aims to better predict how patients will respond to a given therapy by screening their tumors for both genetic abnormalities and protein information, an approach that has been made possible only in recent years due to advances in proteogenomic analysis. Dr. Henry Rodriguez will demonstrate how cancer moonshot can accelerate the cancer research, how it can make more therapies available to more patients, while it will also improve our ability to prevent cancer and detect at an early stage. Lastly, Dr. Rodriguez will talk about NCI Genomic Data Commons. The mission is to provide the cancer research community with a unified data repository that enables data sharing across cancer genomic studies in support of precision medicine. So, let us welcome Dr. Rodriguez for a today's lecture. So, CPTEC today is not the only one that begins to blend the worlds of genomics with proteomics. Two other programs really have come into play and a lot of it is attributed to the cancer moonshot. One of them is referred to as Apollo and the other one is referred to as ICPC or the International Cancer Proteogenome Consortium. And again, the part that's quite nice about all these three is that not only do they blend these worlds together, but everything that we produce genomically, transcriptomically, proteomically and from an imaging from the, from the pathology suite and from the radiology suite, we place it in the public domain. So that said, how are these other two programs and what's their relevance, Apollo and ICPC that comes out of the Cancer Moonshot? So the Cancer Moonshot is an interesting program. This is something that was launched in, in January of 2016. And at the time that, that was being led, in fact, the inspiration was the former Vice President of the United States, uh, Joe Biden. And the part that struck me the most was the simplicity of the overarching goals that the Cancer Moonshot wants to achieve. And that was accelerate progress in cancer. In other words, if something would take 10 years, can you condense it down to five years? And there's many ways that you could achieve that, to be quite candid. But the last two are, are things that the CP type program within the US has been doing now for years. And one is greater cooperation and collaboration. To be very clear, that's not simply collaboration within your own laboratory with your colleague next door on your lab bench or with another person in another lab within your institution. That really was implied on an international scope, which is what they were trying to achieve. And the other one was data sharing make all the data that's really deemed pre-competitive and place it in the public domain as a way of accelerating progress in cancer research. Now, when this actually came out then, I actually then was asked by the White House Cancer Moonshot Task Force to come up with some ideas behind it. The Cancer Moonshot is much larger than these two programs, but one of the things they asked was individuals, hey, can you come up with ideas that we could see that might be interesting to develop? So what started going through my head was basically taking this idea of what CP Tech's been doing with the National Cancer Institute, blending proteomics with genomics, and begin to expand it. So one of the things was, well, can you develop additional efforts in, in, you know, in research groups that now have an interest to blend these two avenues? At the same time, if you look at different organizations, they would be the best to determine what cancers would be most relevant, whether it be within their organization in the United States or outside of the United States. Furthermore, because CP Tech has spent a lot of, quite frankly, time and money developing a lot of these metrics, people will begin to adapt them as appropriate. They're not forced to do it, because I think that's wrong, but if it's appropriate, we want to do that. 
But the part that was really nice was is that everybody would sign what now affectionately referred to as a data sharing pledge. And the pledge is basically a document and it does say it, if you wish to partner with our organization, the information you produce from this research collaboration will be placed in the public domain. We'll host it at the NCI or you could host it anywhere you want, but we want to see it in the public. That was a key thing for us. So the very first one that we decided to do was keep it within the U.S. So right across our hospital in Washington, D.C. happens to be the Naval Hospital. And that was the first one that we decided to strike the deal with. And that program is now is affectionately referred to as Apollo. So Apollo involves the National Cancer Institute, the Department of Defense, and the Veterans Administration. And Apollo basically takes the CPTEC model and we're rolling across all the VA hospitals and all the military hospitals within the U.S. The ultimate goal is to, be, is to be conducting research that begins to blend the existing genomic-based methodologies that's been driving a lot of the patient care with now blending it with the proteomics landscape. Now this one, when this got completed, I thought my job, quite frankly, was done. I could give myself a nice pat on the back. I could go to my wife, hey, you won't believe what I just ended up doing. My daughter would be like, wow, that's amazing what you ended up doing. It turns out it wasn't that easy. Because when this got done, then I get another phone call. And the phone call is, well, we love what you ended up doing here, but can you bring outside countries now into this mix? I thought it was an interesting call. So we decided to take the challenge upon us. So in summer now of 2016, we decided to take the program on an international level. Partly because we also had little collaborations with some institutions across the U.S., and, but we decided to now formalize it across the, uh, the uh, cancer moonshot activity. So the very first country that signs on to this idea of developing this partnership with the National Cancer Institute becomes Australia. So we had Australia on board and we brought in four institutions. Now, again, I thought my job was done. I satisfied a phone call. Nope, it's never that easy, it turns out. When you deliver, typically people want more. So rule of thumb, you want to under-promise and over-deliver, which is what I've learned. Because the minute you start delivering, everybody expects even above that now. So I ended up then getting that second phone call. The second phone call becomes, okay, we love what you ended up doing with Australia. And in fact, it was great because the former Vice President Joe Biden flies to Australia and he does this big opening. Another phone call comes down the road and the question is, well, can you bring other countries? And by the way, you have eight weeks to do this. I had no idea why eight weeks was relevant. I found out later on that it was going to be announced at the United Nations. But nevertheless, I decided to take the challenge again. So in July of 2016, we ended up going from one country, four institutions, in a span of eight weeks, we expanded this now to eight countries, and we brought in 16 institutions. Now this happens to be September of 2016. Obviously now, we're in December of what, 2018. So the question is, whatever came of this program? So to my surprise, but to my pleasure, I have to admit, this that has now taken a life on its own. So this now is officially known as ICPC. This is the International Cancer Proteogenome Consortium. This now involves 12 countries, spanning 31 institutions, collectively all working together on just over a dozen cancer types. Some of these cancer types do overlap, but that's actually fine. Because I'm the first one that I've wanted to know for years why, for example, individuals in the United States that are predominantly going to be of European descent develop breast cancer women, yet these individuals, a lot of it's going to be smoke-based, you find out, but yet you go to Asia, a lot of women really don't smoke and they're developing breast cancer. For me, the goal is very simple of ICPC. Ultimately, what we want to do is develop a database, a resource, that now is finally going to be representative of the diversity of individuals along with their cancers across the globe and give all the information back into the public domain. So what has the program done in the past 12 months? Not, you know, since the time this thing was created. So here's an example of what we've done. So the very first data set, because at the time people said, oh, you'll never get other countries to make the data public. No one's ever going to do that. I have no idea why people say this, because if you sign a paper, and that's part of what you sign on to, it's like a marriage contract to me. Yes, you said, I will, I do, and you expect something to happen. And we're not having difficulty thus far. So the very first data set that got released was in September of 2017 by our colleagues in Taiwan. 
a very unique study that they ended up doing for oral cancer, which is very dominant there, especially within the rural population because of the betel nut that they happen to chew, along with all the components that they add to that. Then at the same time, what we did last year, we actually held local cancer moonshot workshops as a way of raising greater awareness within the local municipalities. Same thing that is going to be happening here within the cancer moonshot activities. Raising the awareness that helps then those individuals, those universities, and those countries raise their own capital funding to launch larger initiatives within their own component. At the same time, we actually had, uh, uh, so, so one was, was actually being held in Australia and the other one was done in Sweden. We also welcomed last calendar year officially two uh, or three additional institutions spanning two countries. The very first one was Korea University, which joined us uh, in uh, what, October of 2017. And of course, India joined in May of 2018. And we also launched an international, or we piloted a student exchange program from Australia with one of our laboratories based in the US. The other thing that we're starting to do is because all this is research-based pretty much use only, is that we're starting to convert some of these laboratories on an international level to become CLIA certified. And these are the targeted-based assays. Why, do you, why would it be advantageous to be CLIA certified? Because that means you could take the information that comes out of your instrument and take it directly back to a tumor ward to give it back to a patient. So we're starting to build the infrastructure more and more on an international scope. This is a hugely fun program, I have to admit. We get together now at least once per year. The very last time we got together was in the United States in the state of Florida. And as you can see down on the right, these are the other times that we've gotten together. But now, as a sense of pride, we all get together and at the meetings we all hold our representative country flag because it's really multiple nations recognizing that cancer is simply not something that's locked to one nation. It's an international effort that we need to resolve. So in, in the last five minutes, let me talk about big data because I talked about that we give away all these data sets. Now, first of all, I love the terminology big data. I have to admit, I have no idea what that means anymore. And being here in the past couple of days, people are talking about precision-based measurements. What exactly is big? That's a very subjective terminology. Is this big or is this big or is that big? But people love to use phrases, so I'll use them in my talk. But when people talk about genomics within the National Cancer Institute, one of the things that we now we've started to do is we want to make it more easy for people to get access to our data sets. So now what we've done within the NCI is we're, we're developing data commons. So in the genomics landscape, we've launched just last calendar year what's now known as the genomic data commons. This is predominantly the data sets that comes out of the Cancer Genome Atlas. The part that's quite nice is that the ultimate goal is everything is based in the cloud. You don't even have to download the data packets anymore. And a lot of the software tools are all dockerized within the cloud itself. So that's the genomics landscape. So the question becomes, well, NCI, what else are you doing? Because there's more than genomics. And I remember, Rodriguez, you just said that you love the proteomics landscape, mixing it with the genomics. So here's what NCI is now doing. The ultimate goal now for the institute is no longer to have this genomic data commons. It's basically to have a cancer research data commons. And that's going to involve multiple modalities of the different types of omics. Obviously, the one that I want to point out, which is why we're here, is we're going to be building a proteomic data commons. And you'll be hearing lectures tomorrow exactly how the proteomics information is slowly being rolled into this landscape. But if people want to play with it today, they did have a soft launch this calendar year. Here's the website. Please go to it. Look at it. Play with it. Critique it. Provide your comments, because those are things that we're trying to do. This is basically, as if you have your restaurant, it's a soft launch. So this is like our alpha launch equivalent. But it's out there now, and ultimately the goal is all the data sets, it's predominantly uh, populated with the CPTEC data sets, but it all directly links back with TCGA. And obviously the goal for us in the future is to have all everything based in the cloud along with the computational capability that we want to put into this. But ultimately, the goal is simply to have a cancer research data commons. Now, lastly is this one. These programs produce a lot of data sets, I have to admit. Well, so what do you do with the data? Well, our investigators, we do give grants and they try to analyze the data the best they can. The question becomes is, have you really taken or extracted all the knowledge out of the data that you possibly could? Quite frankly, I have to admit, my answer for many years was, of course, we've looked at everything you can look at the data sets. 
So about five years ago, I ended up meeting an individual named Gustavo Stolovitsky who actually came up with something called Dream Challenges. And he has, a, he has an academic appointment uh, in, in New York, but he predominantly works for IBM. And his comment to me was, quite frankly, he said, you're an idiot. <laughs> I actually liked him when he phrased it, because my comment was, so why do you say this? And he explained to me that he created something called Challenges, where he basically takes existing data sets that are out there, and he challenges then the community just like you guys were doing with these questionnaires, can somebody come up with a better way or a better algorithm to go after the information that either you could not extract from it or you did extract but it wasn't as efficient as time moves on with better tools that are now being developed. So ultimately the goal that I came up with is this easy cartoon. There's a cool little website, you could actually take a picture of Einstein and you can literally type in questions that it appears that Einstein is writing. So for me, this is exactly what I used to do when I used to be within the university setting. Is typically what you do when you run a laboratory is you do your experiments, you collect a lot of information, you find very nice correlations, you try to develop these fancy graphs like volcano plots I saw being talked about. Yes, very attractive, you know, they're quite complicated. I think people just say nod their head. Yes, I understand, I don't know if they do. But at the end of the day, what you want to do is basically publish a paper. It's a very effective model. Because what you want is these individual laboratories, which are very elaborate, like artisans. That's a lot of the creativity that's out there. And I love that landscape space. But the question becomes is, well, what if you took that information and you put it out in the public? And you begin to crowdsource a question. So that's what we wanted to explore. So the very first one that we ended up doing was about two years ago. And it was the very first proteogenomic computational challenge that was crowdsourced. We teamed up at this point with the, with, with the Dream organization. We actually brought in uh, NVIDIA, which is the graphical chip manufacturer. We partnered with them. They gave us a, 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 some uh, server frames for what they wanted to do. But ultimately, they, they also contributed a, a uh, monetary award to this. And we also partnered with Nature Methods. You're not guaranteed to get your findings published, but you're pretty much guaranteed to send it out for review, which is quite nice. But ultimately, at the end of the day, is we literally thought we would get maybe 50 individuals applying to a challenge. To our surprise, we got over 500 individuals that applied to the challenge and actually spanned 20 countries. Now, this challenge predominantly was a biological-driven challenge. We took our data sets and we basically asked simplistic questions. So challenge one, you could see basically is if we give you DNA and RNA, how good are your predictors now determining the abundance? If we give you DNA and RNA in abundance, how good are your predictors at looking at the phosphorylation? And the way that a lot of us now like to phrase it is, the good news is you have winners. The very good news is, is that it turns out the computational tools are still not as good as a physical based measurement. So people that are going in proteomics, you clearly will have jobs for the years to come, which is what I would like to say. So, but here's the part that really struck me the most, is that out of the universities or the institutions that we thought would have won, no, we're not the ones that won at all. In fact, there were groups that we never heard of within my own program. So two of these challenges was won by colleagues at the University of Michigan, and another challenge actually got won by a group at Korea University. Now, this was a biologically driven challenge. This actually caught the attention now of the Food and Drug Administration back in the United States, and we decided to do a new challenge with them. So now the FDA has launched the very first regulatory proteogenomic based challenge. And here it is. It's still technically ongoing. So this one now basically again, it looks at like crowdsourcing. It no longer involves the dream challenge, although it's a partnership with them still, but pretty much with the US FDA. And what we're doing here is something that technically can happen. If you, if you take an, an individual sample, and ultimately the sample goes to multiple laboratories, one for genomics, one for maybe metabolomics, or one for proteomics. In our case, genomics, transcriptomic, and proteomics. What if one of these samples become misplaced or mislabeled, and the information comes back? So we ask that question, and using either genomics or then taking genomics and throwing proteomics, how easily are you able to identify and most likely put the information back to identify where the mix-up occurred? So this is the very first one with the FDA, and, 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 and it's still open if you quickly want to join it. But hopefully the goal out of this is that it kind of shows is that when you put the information in the public domain, there is other utilities behind it. So lastly, what I want to say is I hope, I hope that I've been able to kind of demonstrate how what we've been doing out at the NCI 
And now with these moonshot based efforts, whether it be in the US or on an international level, is that at least for me, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these converts. To me, I actually come from a genomics background, if people ever look at my old history. But I'm actually convinced is that if people talk about precision medicine or precision oncology, for me that's really what I like to define as a team sport. It's not genomics in isolation, it's not either metabolomics in isolation, or it's not proteomics in isolation. If these technologies are robust and mature and they're quantitative and there's the ability to combine them, to me that's really what fulfills the underlying story of biology and really could push precision oncology even further. So with that, I want to thank everyone for your attention. I'll be more and be glad to address questions at this point. Thank you, everyone. Uh, sir, uh, though it might be more uh, over ambitious what I am asking for, why should we stop NCI with uh, cancer research data comments alone? Can't, it, can't you include aging uh, and um, diabetes into this? Okay, so if I understand it correctly, the question is for the data commons of NCI, can you include aging and diabetes? So aging is part of it because that's part of the metadata that we want, right? So all the electronic health records comes along with it. But diabetes is a very difficult one uh, because obviously, so, so the way that I phrase it is, if you look at NCI, C is cancer. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that within our assay portal, two years ago, people were asking me, we would like to deposit our assays into your portal. And actually, they were coming from the Diabetes Institute. And I'll be honest, my, my first reaction was no, because ours is oncology. But the more that I started to kind of think about it, is really almost all biology plays a role in all these diseases. So I'd say as things evolve, there's always these possibilities. Thank you, Dr. Project, for the wonderful talk. I would like to know uh, that uh, uh, in this huge data base that you've already uh, managed to accumulate, uh, do you have data regarding uh, patient trials as a sense of uh, even about treatment of cancer? Do you have data on that, treated cancer and uh, recurrent cancer sector? So the data of that? As a de-identified, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so there's separate data sets? Of there's a couple of in there, yeah. So, so within the U.S., there's a couple of sites that you're allowed to download certain, certain types of information. Okay. So, you, so, but when you apply to it, obviously, you have to identify what the information is going to be used for because there's a higher level of criteria. So, so typically, treatment-naive information, that's more simplistic to get your access to. But the more you start moving into that space, and if it's de-identifying, and, and, it, and if it is made available, it's just a higher rigor to get access to it. And um, NCI is now also um, investing in uh, this alternate and medicines, etc. So is there any kind of uh, you know, future thinking of incorporating that either? So when you say alternative medicine, I'm assuming you're talking more natural products? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that one I actually don't know if that sits in the population set. I do know NCI does have a big repository of natural products and they're trying to identify more uh, applications that, that it could be applied to. Quite frankly, I don't see why not, if that won't be part of it, but at least I'm not, I'm not aware of any activity at the moment. Oh yeah. I, I'm not from cancer background, so right. I'm, I'm, I'm from a different background. But my curiosity to know about this, uh, okay, it's fine. Whatever you are doing to treat, to get out of this cancer. But uh, is there anything like that? What kind of people would be most prone to cancer? Uh, that kind of. So the question is, and let, let me make sure that I understand it. So yours is, are you able to identify individuals that could be more susceptible to the development of cancer? Yeah. So, so those are epidemiology based studies, right? Where you're trying to understand the environment, the food, and all those components. I mean, those are separate components within the NCI. Those things do exist as, as part of the organization that they go after. That is the number one question that I get. How, so how come you guys don't do metabolites? My God, you guys need metabolites. So, I, yeah, so I, I, I personally like to simplify things, and from what I've seen is that it is already so complex, quite frankly, just to mix proteomics with genomics and transcriptomics, adding a, another layer of complexity, 
uh, even makes it more complex. So what I tend to always want to know is a very simple question. You ask the people already that are understanding that disease and then you ask them, do you already use metabolites first and foremost to screen something of that individual for that disease of interest? So for example, GBM, right? So like brain cancer, people develop panels now. So we do have a GBM project. Metabolites is part of the formula. But, 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 but at least what we try to avoid because it just adds additional time and cost is we really want to make certain that you just don't do something for the sake of doing it. You, you have some logic on why you would like to do it. But the reality is we are playing with it, but not to the scale that we mix DNA, RNA, and proteins. It's just a side project at the moment. In conclusion, we understand that how much initiative has already been taken by the NIH to manage multimodal data in the form of repository and global databases. The genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, imaging data when kept under the same roof and analyzed properly could provide many new facets, many new unrevealed facts. Precision medicine success story could only be written when large number of data set from all omics field are together analyzed thoroughly and then only meaningful conclusions can be drawn. Though we are generating large amount of data from NGS platforms and mass spectrometry technologies, but whether these big data sets are fully analyzed, proper QC checks have been performed, we have to look into all of this very carefully. So, let us thank Dr. Rodriguez for his wonderful lecture which has really set up a good stage for this course why there is need to look at new approaches of proteogenomic analysis. Now, we will move on to the modules, the very first module on the genomic technologies and the first lecture of that will be given by Dr. Kelly Ruggles next week talking about introduction to genomics. Thank you.